Good evening. Everybody get settled. On behalf of the Hudson Library and Historical Society and the staff and the director and the board of trustees, I want to welcome you. And more importantly, I want to wish you all a happy and wonderful Constitution Week. It's our honor this evening to have a wonderful speaker, but before I get to his qualifications and certifications and everything else, I want to tell you a, a few little housekeeping details. Um, first of all, there will be a reception immediately following this in the rotunda. If you go out here, hang a left, and go down into the central part of the library, there will be a, a reception with cookies and refreshments, and uh, Professor Beeman will be available for signing of books. And speaking of books, outside the doorway to the left, the Learned Owl currently has his publications for sale, and they will also be for sale in the rotunda. So I want to say thank you to the Learned Owl for coming and you know, providing that resource for us. Um, secondly, I want to tell you uh, a thank you to the DAR for providing the free constitutions you all got to celebrate Constitution Week. And there's a librarian in the back reminding me that there's a donation box. And I should tell you that libraries are constantly under assault in terms of using our resources wisely. And we can always use a little extra resources. So if you think about it and have a few extra dollars in your wallet or something this evening, we appreciate it. And I can guarantee you all those funds go to programs like this and or to the collections in order to provide you wonderful resources. So if you have a place in your heart for libraries, remember the donation box. And finally, I want to tell you about something that I'm learning about, which is Hoopla. It's a new service we provide here at the library. If you go onto our website and look for the word Hoopla, you'll see it. And you can click on that. And if you click on that, you'll see American Heritage Series. And this is part of the inaugural series of the American Heritage Lecture Series. Forever and ever, this library is going to provide a series of lectures that deal literally with American heritage and American history. So click on American Heritage Lecture Series, and if you click underneath that, you will find Mr. Beeman, our, our wonderful speaker's books are audio uh, available there on the web page um, for all of you to enjoy and listen to. So his lecture will also be podcast later on the website as well, but it takes us a few weeks to edit and get it all situated and put up. Now that we have the housekeeping details out of our way, I have to concentrate because this man has a lot of wonderful qualifications. Dr. Beeman is an American historian specializing in the American Revolution. He has written numerous books, far more than I could read. I only read one of them. And he is John Walsh Centennial Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania, although he just told me he's now emeritus. Uh, he is a member of the Board of Trustees of the National Constitution Center, and he has served as director of the Philadelphia Center for Early American Studies and as editor for the American Quarterly. Now, if that weren't enough, he is the recipient of countless awards, including fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and the Huntington Library. I have to tell you, while I met him and greeted him and, and brought him into Hudson and introduced him to our community, he told me that he was in recent correspondence with one of his graduates, who now happens to be the president of Yale University. Um, the man is very well thought of. He is a distinguished professor of American history, excuse me, I'm misquoting this. He has served as Fulbright Professor in the United Kingdom and Vivian, am I saying this worse? The Harnsworth Distinguished Professor of American History at Oxford University. When we conceived of the American Heritage Series, we really wanted someone that could speak to the heart of what our nation was about in its very earliest days and the underpinning of our government. And we could find no one better than this man. He came highly recommended to our community and I think that he is a wonderful, learned man who has got much to share with our community, especially in this pertinent time of Constitution Week and with our government in such a flux, I shall say. <laughs> so without further ado, please put your hands together and help me welcome Dr. Richard Beeman to Hudson, Ohio. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gwen. Am I on here? Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Um, 
It is my great honor uh, to be here before a full house uh, in this truly beautiful library. This is uh, really one of the most remarkable uh, public libraries for a town this size that uh, I've ever seen. So I think that you're all very lucky to have this uh, wonderful uh, resource. Uh, so um, uh, this uh, a picture uh, before you, uh, 226 years and one day ago, uh, these 38 men gathered uh, in the assembly room of the Pennsylvania uh, State House. There were actually 39 signers of the Constitution, but uh, John Dickinson uh, of Delaware was ill that day, and so he wasn't there, but he had a, one of his colleagues sign it for him. Uh, the picture, am I echoing a bit? I don't know if somebody can, I'll move this down, maybe that will help. Um, uh, the picture uh, on the screen is actually uh, on the cover of uh, one of my books and my principal book on the Constitutional Convention, Plain Honest Men, The Making of the American uh, Constitution. Uh, among the, the portraits of the uh, founding fathers, this artistically is by no means the most distinguished, but I chose it uh, to be on the cover of my book. It was written, it was uh, painted uh, by a, a, a fairly modern his, historia, historical artist, uh, Louis Glantzman, for the bicentennial of 1987. But the reason I chose it is that Glantzman uh, for the, was the first artist to do this who had available to him portraits of virtually every one of the signers of the Constitution. So uh, these men that you see in this portrait probably did look pretty much like they look uh, in, in the picture uh, bef before you. Uh, I would note uh, just uh, one thing, however. I said virtually every portrait he had. You see this gentleman here with his back to you. <laughs> That's Jacob Broom of Delaware, and there is no portrait of Jacob Broom. So that's the way Louis Glantzman got around uh, that, by having him bending over the table, uh, signing uh, the Constitution. Uh, before I begin the uh, formal part of my talk, I do want to indulge myself in a little bit of autobiography. Uh, I have been passionately interested in the subject of the making of the Constitution for 47 years. That was 1966 uh, when Catherine Drinker Bowen uh, wrote her wonderful history of the Constitution miracle uh, at Philadelphia. And that is what uh, excited my interest in this subject. I obviously would not have written my book uh, had I not thought that I could say something that she hadn't, uh, but I'm still a great admirer of that book. I've been teaching this subject of the Constitution at the University of Pennsylvania for 45 years. Uh, I, I just retired uh, last year. Uh, for most of those years, I wrote a lot of books and dozens and dozens of articles that none of you would really want to read, mainly written for my fellow academics, uh, fellow professors, and, and graduate students. Uh, but beginning uh, five or six years ago, I decided that I really did want to begin to write books for a a wider uh, audience. Uh, 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 that audience of what I call the elusive, intelligent general public. Uh, I'm assuming that everyone in this room is part of that elusive, intelligent uh, general uh, public. And as it turned out, my timing, uh, uh, purely selfishly, uh, could not have been better. Uh, in particular, my book, a Plain Honest Men, and subsequently a smaller book I wrote called The Penguin Guide to the U.S. Constitution, uh, came out near the beginning of an incredible escalation of the intensity of our constitutional debate uh, in this uh, country. Uh, now, mind you, Americans, almost from the moment the Constitution was first ratified by the American people in 1788, Americans have revered their constitution. Um, you know, uh, as a nation, we have no common national religion. We have no common uh, national uh, ethnicity. 
Um, and what has happened is that the Constitution has become our civil religion, uh, our secular the sacred text, uh, which helps Americans to define uh, their common identity, those things uh, that, that bind them together. This has always been the case uh, in America, but never in my lifetime has a debate uh, over the meaning of our Constitution been as intense uh, or as nasty uh, as it has become today. Uh, uh, I, I should say this, and I suspect there uh, may be some, maybe many, uh, uh, Tea Party members in this audience, uh, but I, I frequently, only half jokingly, uh, say that I owe a great debt of gratitude to the Tea Party because in their vigorous denunciations of Barack Obama and the Democratic Party as destroyers of the Constitution, they've raised the intense interest in the Constitution enormously and have helped my book sales a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but the downside of all of that uh, uh, truly uh, is that never in my lifetime have our politics uh, been more acrimonious and uncivil uh, than they are today. And in particular, it's a time when the members of our National Congress are more divided uh, and, and more vituperative to one another. Uh, and indeed, a time when the Congress itself, as an institution, appears to the American people to be more dysfunctional than any time. Uh, in its history. You know, in these uh, public opinion polls, the approval rating of Congress is somewhere between 9 and 13 percent. That's even lower than Wall Street bankers uh, in terms of approval uh, uh, ratings. Uh, truly, in its present incarnation, our Congress hardly lives up uh, to the expectations that the framers uh, had for it uh, when they put it in Article I of the Constitution, right there up front in the largest single article of the Constitution. Uh, in light of all of that, I'd now like to turn back in time uh, 226 years uh, and one day and pose the question, how was it that the 55 men uh, gathered in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787? A group of men extraordinarily diverse in their cultural backgrounds. Now, I know when you look at these folks, uh, hey, guess what? They're all a bunch of wealthy white men, uh, a very homogeneous group. They look that way to us today. But in the context of the 18th uh, century, uh, representing widely varying interests, merchants, lawyers, large-scale farmers and plantation owners, slave owners and non-slave owners, each coming to Philadelphia with their own regional identities and perhaps most important of all, coming to Philadelphia with their primary identities as representatives of independent and sovereign states. Uh, this really was a diverse group. How was it uh, that this group of men uh, in less than four months' time was to able to create a document that was, to use George Washington's phrase, so little liable to well-founded objections. Uh, and I've come up with uh, three explanations. Uh, the first lies in the fact that they met in secret and were able to a remarkable extent to enforce that secrecy all summer. Literally, the people of America had no idea uh, what they were doing a distinctly undemocratic, untransparent way of doing business. Indeed, unthinkable, perhaps undesirable in today's world. But it allowed the delegates to engage in genuine discussion, to float trial balloons, and when they found themselves in disagreement, as they often did, to repair at the end of the day to Philadelphia's City Tavern, which is still in uh, operation, uh, today, I'm, I'm sorry, I just have to do a little digression. It just uh, popped into my head. I don't know if any of you ever saw the PBS series uh, Constitution USA, which aired in uh, uh, April and May of this year. Uh, Peter Sagal, the host of the NPR show Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, was uh, the narrator. 
And, and I'm uh, one of the people featured in all of the uh, four episodes of, of, of that show. And we met in Independence Hall in this room uh, where he asked me about the Founding Fathers. But I keep, kept telling him, well, you know, but then they went to City Tavern, and that's where they really started doing their work. Uh, and so, indeed, the next morning, they rearranged their schedule. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, Peter Sagal and I were sitting in, Peter, uh, in City Tavern uh, with pewter mugs of, of beer in front of us <laughs> talking about the making of the Constitution. Uh, and, and a lot of drinking uh, they did. These 18th century Americans uh, really did uh, have extraordinary uh, drinking habits. I can't resist uh, reading you this one uh, factoid. Uh, uh, th this comes uh, from a bill uh, given to the City Light Horse Troop uh, following uh, a party that they hosted uh, for the members of the Constitutional Convention uh, on Friday night, September 14, 1787. Uh, by that time, they really had pretty much already reached their agreement, so this was going to be a real a celebration. Fifty-five men attended uh, this party, and those 55 men drank 54 bottles of Madeira, 60 bottles of claret, 50 bottles of old stock, dozens and dozens of casks of porter, beer, cider, and large bowls of rum punch. <laughs> uh, uh, the City Light Horse Troop the following day was given a bill by the City Tavern, which not only included all the booze they drank, but a bill for breakage. <laughs> Apparently, uh, they, they got quite uh, 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 vociferous. But in any case, to get back to the story at hand, uh, these founding fathers would indeed uh, go to uh, City Tavern and other taverns, and, and then after a good night of sleep, put the disagreements of the previous day behind them and try once again to reach consensus on the issues before them. I don't think I need to belabor, belabor the comparison with today's political world, but I think we can all imagine the difference if we were to hold a constitutional convention today with political action committees uh, trying to enforce public opinion to their specific interests, to lobbyists directly uh, influencing the behavior of the delegates to the convention. The delegates are giving passionate speeches on the a convention floor, staking out their positions. And then at the end of the day, delivering sound bites to the television cameras from MSNBC, CNN, and Fox News. With the consequence being that political positions taken on the convention floor became even, uh, would become even more strident, more inflexible. A scene, I think, that would make me at least hope that the American public will never avail themselves of their constitutional right to call another constitutional convention. The second explanation uh, is very closely related uh, to the first. Uh, and, and that was the extraordinary intimacy of the spaces in which the delegates did their work. I suspect many of you have at some point in your lives been uh, to Independence Hall. So you've seen that the assembly room is actually a very a small room. It's 40 feet by 40 feet. Uh, it's smaller than this room, much smaller, about half the size of uh, this room. And indeed, there's this, uh, this rail right here that goes uh, across the room uh, that it separates the visitors from the people doing business. So it's really only about 30 by 40 feet. Very difficult for a delegate even to whisper to a neighbor without being overheard. And since those 18th century politicians were operating in a culture in which civility was perhaps more highly valued than it is in our own, uh, uh, there were no Anthony Wieners at the Constitutional <laughs> Convention. Although there's someone who comes close, I'll mention him in a minute. The intimacy of their working space really did serve to reinforce collegiality among them. 
and again after the day's official work was done, dining and drinking together around a common table, lodging together at one of the city's boarding houses. Indeed, the Connecticut delegation actually had to share a bedroom in one of the boarding houses. Well, this, by the way, I think is one reason that these delegates got so much done in under four months' time. They wanted to get the heck home as quickly as uh, possible and get a good night's sleep. Uh, all of that conviviality fostered an impulse toward consensus, not easily replicated uh, today. I am old enough to remember a time when that was commonplace among our members of Congress. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Lyndon Johnson and Senate Minority Leader Everett Dirksen, who would disagree on the Senate floor and then they'd go out eating and drinking together and find out a way to uh, work out uh, a deal that would actually get some legislation uh, passed. Or uh, more recently, Tip O'Neill, the Speaker of the House, and President Ronald Reagan, uh, who often disagreed quite vociferously in public, but would meet in private and find a way uh, to reach some kind of consensus uh, on the issues uh, before, uh, before them. I do realize that the conditions under which our Congress people today uh, work are very, very different. The demand, particularly in the House of Representatives, where the demands of a perpetual election campaign require uh, that they uh, be on the road three or four days a week uh, raising money. Uh, but this fostering of convivial relationships uh, among politicians does seem to me to be such a very important thing. And it is uh, virtually absent uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, today. Uh, through my involvement at the National Constitution Center, I have dined with a number uh, of these Congress people. Uh, and, and they speak of their uh, Democratic or Republican opponents uh, as evil people. It's really quite uh, uh, remarkable. Uh, so the founders were able to come to, to, to like and respect one another uh, as, as decent people, uh, working for the common good, even when they disagreed on specifics. The third explanation on which I want to spend the rest of my time this evening does seem to me the most important. And I speak of leadership and of the varieties of leadership uh, at the convention. Uh, over the course of the past many years, as I've lived with the 55 delegates who attended the convention that summer, I have become uh, more and more impressed by the importance of individual leaders in the making of the Constitution. But perhaps even more strikingly, I've become impressed with the importance of collective leadership. However talented many of the 55 delegates may have been, all that talent might well have worked in counterproductive ways had they not possessed an understanding that cooperation, forbearance, and ultimately compromise were every bit as important as individual brilliance in the business of constitution making. There were, to be sure, some among the 55 delegates whose contributions to the finished document were negligible. Uh, there were perhaps as many as a dozen who were notable primarily from the, uh, by their, uh, noted for their absence from the convention. And at least a few, this is Gunning Bedford of Delaware, a corpulent, florid-faced man given to outbursts uh, accusing the large state delegates of attempting to destroy his tiny state of Delaware. At one point, he threatened to lead Delaware into an alliance with a foreign power, probably Spain. Very few people in Delaware spoke Spanish, so this seemed like a really bad idea. Uh, but if he would lead them uh, into a, an alliance with Spain if uh, uh, the Delaware did not get its way uh, on the issue of representation. Uh, and here's Luther Martin of Maryland, described by one distinguished historian as having been sober on only a half dozen occasions in his life, none of them during the Constitutional Convention. <laughs> On June 28th, uh, 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 Luther Martin began 
uh, an alcohol-fueled speech that lasted for a day and a half uh, in which he was denouncing virtually every aspect uh, of the deliberations of the delegates uh, thus far. James Madison, who's out in the hall, as you probably saw, although he's a very skinny James Madison uh, out in the hall, uh, uh, was the, the uh, unofficial note taker uh, of the convention. He did this purely, almost against the rules of the convention. Uh, but, but Madison, after about six hours of listening to Martin's speech, just threw up his hands and said, enough of this, and uh, just noted in his diary that uh, Mr. Martin continued in a similar fashion for a considerable period of time. And there was uh, at least one certifiable curmudgeon uh, in the convention. This is Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts. Uh, pretty much, he pretty much hated every minute of his summer in Philadelphia. He complained about the heat, the stench of the city, the manners and morals of the city's citizens. And over the course of the convention's proceedings, he criticized nearly every feature of the document uh, the delegates were drafting, doing pretty much everything he could to torpedo uh, the whole uh, effort. Uh, much of his uh, grumping was uh, perhaps based on political principle, but I do have another interpretation of uh, Mr. Gary's uh, foul mood. Uh, uh, Elbridge Gary was 44 years old at the time, although in fact he looked maybe 20 years older. Uh, than that, but the week before the convention convened in Philadelphia, uh, he married a 22-year-old young woman from uh, New York City. Uh, and they basically came to Philadelphia, they rented a house, uh, and planned to spend their honeymoon uh, that summer while he worked on the Constitution. Well, Gary's 22-year-old uh, wife um, uh, has spent about three days in Philadelphia and decided, man, this place is really boring compared to New York City and went back to New York City. Gary had to move into a boarding house with his fellow Massachusetts delegates and remain grumpy for the rest uh, of the summer. But on the whole, it's hard not to be impressed by the way in which most of the men present that summer were able to check their egos uh, at the door and to take seriously the business of creating that more perfect union. The qualities of the leadership present in the convention were enormously varied, and this evening I want to offer uh, you just a few examples of those delegates who I think made the most important contributions uh, to the completed uh, Constitution. And I begin with the man uh, who provided the guiding intellectual force behind first the movement to call a convention, and then the effort to craft a proposal that amounted to what I, I have argued but was a genuine revolution in the nature of the American government. Uh, a 37-year-old bachelor at the time, standing only an inch over five feet tall uh, and prematurely balding, unlike his counterpart in, in, the, in the lobby, uh, Madison frequently brushed the few remaining wisps of hair at the top of his head downward to hide his bald spot in, in what today I think we would call a comb over. Uh, chronically suffering from a combination of uh, poor physical health and hypochondria, painfully awkward in any form of public speech, all the delegates strained to hear what he was saying. They all complained about his mumbling. Uh, Madison came across as neither a commanding nor a self-confident figure. But he more than made up for those deficiencies uh, by the force and persistence of his intellect. He arrived in Philadelphia on May 3rd, 1787, 11 days before the convention was due to begin and 22 days before it actually began. Alone among the delegates, he had spent months during the winter and early spring of 1787 preparing himself both intellectually and politically uh, for the upcoming gathering. Imagine then his disappointment when he discovered that on the day the convention was due to begin, May 14, 1787, the only delegates from outside of Pennsylvania, and all of Pennsylvania's delegates lived in Philadelphia, so they were there already. The only delegates from outside of Pennsylvania to arrive were he and George Washington. This failure of the delegates to show up on time it took another 11 days 
before even a bare quorum of seven of 13 states uh, uh, made it to Philadelphia. Uh, uh, this failure of the delegates to show up on time really is remarkable. The other important thing uh, to remember is that uh, although this group of people that you saw in that first slide, it, they were a very distinguished bunch, um, uh, but there was an equally dis uh, distinguished bunch of uh, America's, quote, founding fathers who chose not to attend the convention, even though they were elected by their state legislatures to do so. You know, one of the really depressing uh, facts of our current state of knowledge of American history today is that a majority of the American people, including a majority of high school seniors, do we have any high school seniors here, uh, 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 mix up the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. A majority of Americans believe that that phrase, all men are created equal, uh, is in the US Constitution, uh, not in uh, the Declaration of Independence. In fact, only eight of the uh, 55 delegates who attended uh, the Constitutional Convention were among the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. Only six of the signers of the Declaration of Independence also signed uh, the Constitution. So in a way, it was a very uh, different bunch. Uh, and the bunch who even showed up uh, were very late in attending. Wouldn't each of us, if we had been elected, a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, have managed to show up on time? The lesson of all of this, I think, is that the success of this enterprise, far from being inevitable or divinely ordained, was in fact improbable. The challenges facing uh, this uh, gathering, the apathy among political leaders in the individual states, the provincialism among uh, most Americans at the time, uh, they were formidable indeed. But Madison put the 11-day hiatus to good use, working uh, closely with the delegates from uh, Pennsylvania. Madison was the principal architect of what came to be called the Virginia Plan, the proposal that called basically for the scrapping of the old Articles of Confederation altogether and the creation of a national government with a supreme legislature, executive, and judiciary. That's the language of the Virginia Plan. Although the document that finally emerged on September 17th was in fact quite different from the plan that Madison and the Pennsylvanians had crafted uh, during uh, th those uh, days in May, Madison's careful planning and meticulously well-prepared defense of a strong central government truly set the Constitutional Convention on a revolutionary course. Madison's two strongest supporters were two uh, Pennsylvanians, uh, James Wilson uh, and uh, Governor Morris. I want to ask how many of you uh, here, and don't be embarrassed, uh, uh, have uh, uh, ever heard or know anything about either James Wilson or Governor Morris? Four or five, well, maybe six or seven. Uh, this, you're, you're, believe me, common with every group I've ever uh, uh, talked to. But truly, these two men were uh, uh, nearly as important as James Madison in producing uh, our US uh, Constitution. Uh, James Wilson, like Madison, seemed to many observers awkward, somewhat uncomfortable in his own skin. Although perhaps he did not intend it, Wilson took such pride in his intellect that he was sometime unable to hide his feelings of superiority over those ordinary citizens uh, around him. Uh, this portrait here, in which he appears uh, with a prim white wig and thick lens glasses, conveys, at least to me, perhaps I overinterpret this, uh, the suggestion of a man who is looking down his nose at the people around him. Yet Wilson, more than any man in the convention, envisioned an American government and, in particular, an American president, much like those we have today, vigorous and powerful, but based firmly and directly on the will of the people. Reacting to the inability of the Confederation government to speak with a single voice, 
the Articles of Confederation did not even create a chief executive. There was no chief executive uh, during the Confederation period. Wilson argued that only a president elected directly by the people of the nation at large could give the necessary energy and direction to the new government. Wilson was, alas, a minority of one in the convention, and his proposal for direct popular election was never even uh, put to a vote. But throughout the convention, he reminded the delegates that only a government based solidly on the will of we the people and Wilson was the first person to use that phrase, both in debate but also in, in the written language of, of many of the documents of the convention. Only a, that sort of government could fulfill the needs of this still fragile nation. We can also thank Wilson for the peculiar compromise proposal by which we now elect our president, the Electoral College. Although he continued to favor direct popular election uh, of the president, uh, Wilson proposed the Electoral College to the convention uh, as the best alternative, uh, which I think, by and large, it has proven to be. Another delegate uh, from Pennsylvania, uh, this guy right here, slouching somewhat arrogantly in his chair, uh, Governor Morris, uh, played a role at least as significant as that as Wilson, uh, of Wilson, as Wilson, but his personality and character were altogether different from those of either Wilson or James Madison. Whereas Madison had immersed himself in the study of political philosophy at Princeton, and James Wilson had distinguished himself as an outstanding student of theology and philosophy at St. Andrews in his native Scotland, uh, Governor Morris was writing his bachelor's and master's degree essays at King's College, later to become Columbia, on wit and beauty and love. Uh, and whereas Madison's love life, both as a college student and for many years thereafter, resembled that of a medieval monk, a Madison, a poor Madison didn't really begin to get even a personality until he got lucky and married Dolly in the mid-1790s. Uh, uh, Morris's interest in topics such as wit, beauty, and love was not purely cerebral. As a young man, and indeed well into his extended bachelorhood, Morris never passed up an opportunity for amorous adventure, apparently uh, not bothering to ask whether the woman he was engaged with was married or not. Uh, Morris began his career in New York, but after losing favor with many of the leading politicians of that state, he moved to, uh, to Philadelphia. Shortly after his arrival there, he suffered a serious setback of another uh, kind, which unfortunately is not displayed in this uh, only portrait we have of him. In 1780, Morris's leg was caught in the wheel of a carriage, dislocating his ankle joint and badly breaking his leg. His regular physician was temporarily out of town, and acting on the advice of others, uh, Morris agreed to have his leg uh, amputated. Uh, when Morris's own a physician returned, he was appalled by the decision. This certainly would have been a personal injury lawsuit in our 21st century world, but the deed was done. For the rest of his life, Morris would walk with a sink, simple oak, oak peg attached to, to the stump of his leg just below the knee, an infirmity by all accounts that did absolutely nothing to limit his highly active love life. Uh, his his uh, political mentor in uh, New York, John Jay, one of the authors of the Federalist Papers, uh, during this period, sort of observing uh, uh, some of uh, Morris's sexual indiscretions, uh, uh, wrote a letter to a friend in which uh, he said, you know, sometimes I wish uh, uh, that Governor had lost some other body part. <laughs> <laughs> Morris's rise to prominence in Pennsylvania was greatly aided by the mentorship of another Philadelphian. This uh, man uh, standing next to him is the, probably the wealthiest man in all of America, the wealthy Philadelphia merchant Robert Morris. Uh, both of Morris's had an ill-conceived attempt for the common man uh, and for the democratic tendencies of many of the state governments. Uh, although they may have taken their skepticism about democracy to extremes, it is important to remember that many, if not most, of our founding fathers 
did consider themselves to be small r Republicans, not small uh, d uh, Democrats. Uh, the history of America's uh, uh, journey to democracy really is the history of the 25 to 50 years after the Constitutional Convention, a story for another time. Whereas Madison and Wilson strove for moderation in their defense of a strong national government, Governor Morris did not shy away from combat. On several occasions, he made it clear that he would not be at all unhappy if the states were abolished altogether. Uh, and on uh, uh, other occasions, he confronted opponents of the principle of proportional representation from the smaller, less popular, uh, populous states, men like Gunning Bedford of, of Delaware. Uh, confronted them directly, letting them know if they refused to join a union, including such powerful states uh, as Virginia, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania, that they would pay a very heavy price indeed. So Governor Morris was not a model of a bipartisan or a conciliatory politician. But when it came time to pull together all of the many proposals and amendments uh, into a single elegant draft of a completed constitution. It was Governor Morris who provided what James Madison acknowledged was the finish given to the style and arrangement of the constitution. As chairman uh, of a, a committee called the Committee of Style, uh, which was created during the last two weeks of the convention's deliberation, uh, Morris took the 23 articles of the earlier draft of the Constitution, uh, which was drafted during the last week in July. And by combining and editing, reduced that number to seven more artfully worded articles, helping to create the most concise Constitution in the history of the world. For better or for worse, and I, I tell you, a good many constitutional scholars think it's for the worse, although I'm not one of them. Uh, our Constitution, which did fit on those four parchment pages, is by far and away the most concise Constitution uh, in the world. Uh, uh, the Constitution of the State of California is something like 850 pages. Uh, the Constitution of the European <coughs> Union uh, is 1,250 pages and growing. Uh, it's, of course, more like a treaty than a uh, a constitution. I don't know how uh, large the constitution of the state of Ohio is. Perhaps someone can, can inform me of that, but I'll bet it's longer than, than four uh, pages and 4,000 words. And more important, Morris reduced the clunky wording of the preamble of the earlier draft, which began, we the people of the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera with a decidedly more elegant uh, beginning. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty uh, uh, to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution. Morris's revision was not merely more elegant but it suggested that the new government would be founded, or at least it suggested to him, that the new government would be founded on the will and consent of the people of the capital U, capital S, United States, not on the will of the people of the individual states. A fine point, perhaps, one which would have been disputed by many of his fellow delegates at the convention indeed that is disputed by many politicians today, by many Americans today, by virtually all Tea Party members today. But in some important senses, it was the point which gave Abraham Lincoln his constitutional rationale for insisting that the southern states had no right to secede from the Union in 1860-61, a union created by we the people of the capital U, capital S, United States. This is Roger Sherman, delegate from Connecticut. He was in his background, appearance, and personality utterly unlike anyone uh, 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 else in the convention. He was one of the few uh, members who began his life in 
genuinely humble, indeed impoverished circumstances. Through hard work and determination, he rose to a position of modest wealth. Uh, but unlike almost any of the other founding fathers, he did so through salaried positions uh, in service of the public, serving in the state of Connecticut in jobs like inspector of pennies, counter, county surveyor, and rising to the position of judge of the Connecticut uh, Superior uh, Court. Sherman was the most consistent voice for compromise in the convention. He was the first delegate to present what would become known as the Connecticut Compromise, a proposal that finally broke the stalemate in the convention between the so-called large state delegates, who of course wanted representation in both houses of Congress to be apportioned according to population, and the so-called small state delegates, who of course wanted equal representation uh, for each state in, in, in uh, the new uh, Congress. This was a singularly unedifying debate, driven nearly entirely by calculations by the delegates of how the interests of their states could best be served, and not by any lofty principles. But it was a debate that literally deadlocked the convention for six weeks from really the beginning of debates when the Virginia plan was introduced up through the middle of July. The convention was literally threatened to disband, having accomplished nothing uh, unless some sort of resolution of this uh, intense controversy could be resolved. Sherman's solution, proportional representation in the House, equal representation in the Senate, Right? This is not rocket science. I give any one of you two or three minutes, and you can come up with this compromise as the halfway point between uh, those two sides. Sherman's claim to leadership rests, I think, not so much with being the one to first present the compromise to the convention, but uh, for the patient, pragmatic, and essentially unself-interested way in which he championed that proposal during the last two weeks of June and the first two weeks of July. Uh, not only on the convention floor, but again, uh, over plenty of alcohol in the city tavern. There are at least two other individuals present at the convention who had already established distinguished reputations as leaders. Uh, one of those, of course, was that man who sat at that small table on the raised dais uh, in the front of the room. Uh, now, by the way, this portrait of uh, George Washington uh, was uh, painted uh, in July of 1787 by the Philadelphia artist uh, Charles Wilson Peale uh, during uh, actually a, a temporary adjournment of the convention to celebrate the 4th of July. Um, but it is interesting, isn't it, that Washington uh, would bring a military uniform with him <laughs> to the convention. I think he knew that he was going to be asked to sit for portraits, as he so frequently uh, was. Washington had been luxuriating in his retirement at Mount Vernon. And even as he was receiving anguished letters from friends decrying the perilous state of the Union <coughs> under the Articles of Confederation, he tried mightily to resist their calls for a return to public life. And here was his dilemma. He truly knew, and he was right in this, that his presence was absolutely essential if a movement for a new constitution was to be successful. This convention would not, could not, have been a success unless Washington had lent his physical presence to the, presence to the deliberations. But he had no confidence whatsoever that his mere presence would be sufficient to guarantee the success of such a movement. Did Washington, a proud man, really wish to risk a reputation which he had spent so many decades building on a venture that might well fail? But finally, responding to pleas from Virginia's Governor Edmund Randolph and from James Madison, Washington uh, relented and agreed to attend the convention. He knew that the meeting of the delegates would not be a short one. He had no great confidence that it would produce a successful outcome, but early in the morning on May 9th, he got into his carriage 
and made the arduous five-day trip from Mount Vernon to Philadelphia, his rheumatoid arthritis protesting every bump along the way. Finally arriving on May 13th, greeted in the city by huge crowds, church bells ringing and cannons firing. And then imagine his annoyance, his fury to discover on May 14th then he and Madison were the only delegates from out of state who had made the effort to attend. Washington, who did not want to be there, but he was there because he knew that his duty to his country demanded that he be there. Washington attended every single session of the convention. If we were to rely only on the record of debates, we'd be inclined to regard him as a mere figurehead. He seems to have made only one brief and unexceptional speech the whole of that summer. But the record of the convention is incomplete. Eloquent speeches are hardly the sole criterion by which to measure qualities of leadership. Washington, who was elected president of the convention on the first day of the convention, Washington presided. Uh, I, I should say, and uh, a, a book that is actually, that I've just recently completed, uh, that's out there for sale, Our Lives, Our Fortunes, Our Sacred Honor, uh, which is on uh, the two years leading up to independence. And as you may know, uh, uh, John Hancock was president of the Continental Congress uh, during that time, just as George Washington was president of the Constitutional Convention. But that word president, uh, both in 1776 and 1787, did not mean what it means today. It meant essentially a moderator, uh, a person who moderated uh, uh, the discussion among the delegates in a gathering of representatives of independent and sovereign states, or even uh, nation states. So Washington had no power other than the power of his presence. And he used that uh, power to truly preside over the convention. It was Washington who made the decision to recognize Edmund Randolph, the man designated to present the Virginia plan uh, on the first uh, substantive day of business at the convention, a decision that would launch the revolution in government so carefully planned by Madison, Wilson, and Governor Morris. It was Washington day in and day out who would regulate the flow of debate when it appeared that the delegates had reached an impasse on one subject. He seemed to know when to call on the appropriate delegate to change the direction of the debate to another subject on which they might be able to reach some consensus. Washington's force of personality, the very force uh, of his uh, presence. Uh, you know, Washington has for all of my career been the great mystery to me. He doesn't have the intellect of uh, a Madison or a Jefferson or a John Adams. He doesn't have the oratorical abilities of a Sam Adams or a Patrick Henry. Uh, what is uh, uh, the source the, 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 of Washington's greatness? He wa he, and it was a scene by his fellow Americans. He was, even before he became president of the United States, uh, uh, viewed as the father of his country. It was his force of personality, his remarkable self-restraint, uh, but at the same time, uh, his sense of dignity uh, that caused delegates to temper their remarks, to maintain civility even when the strength of their feelings might have led them to incivility. Um, you know, the images of Harry Reid and John Boehner pop into my mind at this point. I, I don't see the connection <laughs> at all. <laughs> On those few occasions when a delegate did allow his passions to get the better of him, Washington knew when to recognize some other more conciliatory speaker. Nowhere was this more apparent nor more important than in the debate on the character and powers of the American president, a vexed subject which confounded the delegates nearly the whole of the summer. Although the debates on that subject often became heated with some delegates rising to warn of the dangers of an elective monarchy, everyone in the room knew that the future first president of the United States, if 
there should be a United States was sitting in that chair on the raised dais in front of them. The framers were united with the notable exception, I might add, of Alexander Hamilton, who is not among the founding fathers who I'm focusing on in this talk about leadership tonight. Uh, with the exception of Alexander Hamilton, all of the framers were united in their desire to avoid uh, creating an elective monarch, an overly powerful uh, chief executive. But the fact that the framers went as far as they did in granting to the president at least limited executive power owes, uh, I believe, to their confidence in the inherent virtue and self-restraint of George Washington. Truly, no deliberative body in all of American history has had a presiding officer with as commanding a presence as George Washington. Although I think perhaps no elective body in all of American history has had leaders less <laughs> impressive than our current ones. I know that John Boehner is from Ohio. I'm sorry, but still. <laughs> My brief snapshot of some of the key individuals at the convention concludes, I think appropriately, uh, with my hometown hero, Benjamin Franklin. For it was Franklin more than any other delegate who recognized that acts of collective leadership were ultimately more important than feats of individual brilliance. In truth, Franklin's contributions to the debates were, to put it charitably, uneven. <coughs> There were moments when the delegates must have simply rolled their eyes heavenward when he put forward some of his uh, pet uh, proposals. Uh, at one point, for example, he proposed that justices of the Supreme Court be selected by a vote among all of the country's lawyers who would, he reasoned, vote for the ablest among them in order to get rid of their competitors and then share their practices among themselves. Can you imagine what would happen if we resorted to that method today with our seven trillion lawyers in the country? <laughs> but when Franklin was good, he was very good. And at no point was he better than on the final day of the convention. On September 17th, he rose with a speech in his hand to give the last important speech that he would make in his life. He was actually too weakened by age and uh, an illness on that day. He was ill much of the convention, although he did attend it every single day of the convention except the opening day. Uh, he was too weakened by age and illness to read the speech himself, so he handed it to James Wilson, who read it for him. Looking back over the nearly four months of debate, disagreement, and occasional outbursts of ill temper, Franklin observed uh, an observation, I think, that should perhaps be carved on the walls of the Senate and House of Representatives chambers in Washington, D.C. He observed that whenever you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you inevitably assemble with those men all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, their local interests, and their selfish views. And isn't that true of every political body that has ever convened uh, in the history of the planet Earth, including our own today? From such an assembly, Franklin asked, can a perfect production ever be expected? He admitted that there were still some parts of the Constitution of which he did not approve. But he said, the older I grow, the more apt I am to doubt my own judgment and to pay more respect to the judgment of others. He then asked those delegates, and I quote again, who may still have objections to this Constitution, to doubt a little of your own infallibility and affix your signatures to the document in spite of your objections. 39 of the 42 delegates, with John Han Don Dickinson, being uh, uh, signature being signed by someone else. Present that day, many of them with serious reservations about features of the proposed Constitution came forward to sign the document and did so in precisely the spirit of fallibility and conciliation which Franklin had urged upon them. As we look back on their actions from the vantage point of our age today, it does indeed seem that all of us have much to learn 
from the collective wisdom and humility displayed by those men who spent that summer in Philadelphia. As the American nation confronts such a daunting array of challenges, both at home and abroad, we can only hope that our nation's leaders might absorb that particular lesson in leadership, in humility, the ability to doubt a little their own sense of infallibility, the wisdom not to allow the perfect to become the enemy of the good. We can only hope that our nation's leaders might absorb that particular lesson in leadership from Benjamin Franklin, the oldest of our founding fathers. Thank you so much for your attention. And thank you. And uh, as usual, I've gone on too long. You have but not gone on too long. We're going to take a few questions, not many. I want them to be direct and short, please, in, in hopes of time. We are going to take just a handful of questions. And then remember, I'll take him out to the rotunda where he'll be available to have more conversation and sign books. Also, don't forget a big round of applause for the Learned Owl, hopefully. And a very gentle reminder, the donation box is in the corner. Okay. Books are available for sale. We love you all. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as we have enjoyed having him here this evening. And if you have questions, please raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. Uh, Dr. Beeman, I wonder if you would speak to why there is so little about the judiciary in the Constitution uh, and what were the arguments perhaps? Well, um, th th there, were, there was, there was, again, if you look at Article 1, it's like this. Article 2 is like this. If the power of the president will be, uh, power of the chief executive will be lodged in the president of the United States, period. <laughs> uh, Article 3, like this, and of course it does not explicitly give to the uh, federal judiciary the power of judicial review. That only comes in 1803. Uh, with John Marshall's decision in Marbury uh, v. Madison. I, I think there, there are two brief answers to that question. One is, without a doubt, the Founding Fathers thought of Congress. They believed in separation of powers, but without a doubt, they believed in Congress as the most important branch of government, uh, the presidency as the second most important, and the judiciary a distant third. Um, and, and of course, as we look at the power of the judiciary today and all the political controversy that surrounds us, uh, obviously, the, the, the power of the court, and if I may say, the nature of judicial activism among our Supreme Court justices has increased enormously uh, uh, over the years. I think the other answer is um, it took them so long to get through the debates uh, on the, uh, the Congress and on the executive branch, they wanted to go home. <laughs> other questions? Let me come over there. By the way, I do love, and I love answering questions more than I enjoy talking at you, so <laughs> I can go on forever. Uh, I'm currently listening to a book on tape, and one of the comments about the Constitution was that the Founding Fathers didn't expect it to last all that long, that Washington thought it would maybe last 20 years, and Franklin, I don't know how long he thought. Yeah. I, I, I don't know the quote uh, uh, from, from Washington, but I absolutely uh, agree with that uh, contention. There is a, a really interesting moment in the debate uh, uh, when um, I'm having a, a, a senior moment, I'm sorry, a delegate from uh, Massachusetts. <laughs> um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, when James Matt, they were debating the ratio of representatives to constituents in the House of Representatives. And James, and, and the, the, the piece of language that was written at the time was that it would be a fixed ratio of one to every 40,000. Uh, and uh, Madison stood up and said, look, I think we need to make this more flexible. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, if uh, the nation, uh, when, uh, if the nation lasts 50 years, uh, and the population increases, then the size of the House of Representatives uh, will be too large. 
uh, and his colleague from uh, uh, Massachusetts, uh, I'm sorry, Nathaniel Gorham, phew, thank you, <laughs> stood up and, and said, the last 50 years, forget it, not a chance. As the country expands and different ethnic groups from different parts of uh, the world uh, immigrate to the United States, this country will not be uh, a single nation. By the way, so they did uh, take Madison's advice. They made it, you know, expansive. If it had been the original one to every 40,000, uh, the House of Representatives would have 7,500 representatives, uh, uh, which would perhaps be even worse than it is today. <laughs> Other questions? Dr. Beeman, uh, was there any mention in the Constitution, considering that uh, Franklin was involved on the press and what its responsibility would be or the country to the press? Because uh, certainly that yeah. has changed the nature of right. leadership. Uh, none none uh, whatsoever, of course. And, and <laughs> they didn't want the press to know what they were doing. They were meeting in secret. But the more important point that I really do want to make uh, in this is that most Americans today, when they think about the Constitution of the United States, think about the Bill of Rights. Uh, and, and indeed, think about those things in the Bill of Rights that talk about what the government cannot do. I can't resist this, I'm sorry, but this is my standard, uh, you know, uh, a little uh, 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 joke. Um, that indeed, when, when we ask the Tea Party what the Constitution is, it's the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, uh, the Tenth Amendment, uh, con you know, all power reserved to the states, uh, and the first five words of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no laws. <laughs> and, but, uh, but in all seriousness, uh, the founding fathers in Philadelphia, the one huge mistake was a failure to add a Bill of Rights. And it was only when the first Congress met, it was only when the Constitution was presented to the people of America at large for ratification, and the people said, why no Bill of Rights? Uh, and so in order to get the Constitution ratified, the supporters of the Constitution had to promise to add it uh, as soon as the new government commenced operation. And that's where the First Amendment and all those others uh, come in to be such a very important part of our sacred document. There's, uh, oh, oh, sorry. Um, I was just wondering if y you might comment, uh, speaking of the Bill of Rights, uh, there's only one of the original ten that has a preamble, and that's the Second Amendment. W w what's your take on the significance of the preamble in the Second Amendment? Um, I, I, um, let me, uh, for all of you, uh, uh, read the, 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 the preamble to the Second um, Amendment to get it exactly right. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And so the constitutional debate that is occurring in the nation today is, uh, what does that comma mean? Is the right to bear arms only associated to service in a well-regulated citizen's militia, or is it every individual's right uh, to bear arms. Uh, I do have opinions about this, but I, I won't so much give you my opinions, but I will say that if you go back and look at the state bills of rights which preceded this Second Amendment, some of those state bills of rights very explicitly connect the right to bear arms uh, with service in a citizen's militia, but others do not, and really talk about an individual right to bear arms. State of Pennsylvania has a, a separate uh, uh, item in their Declaration of Rights uh, guaranteeing the citizens the right to hunt and fowl, uh, which I think usually meant carrying a, a rifle. <laughs> but there are lots of others as well. Um, Dr. Beeman, uh, you've mentioned the Connecticut Compromise. Are you familiar with the web pages posted uh, at a offering the documents showing how the Connecticut Compromise has been trashed by some fraudulent activity? No. <laughs> um, uh, uh, what, 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 you mean the Connecticut Compromise documents? Well, I'm talking about the representation in the Senate. 
Um, the sovereign states no longer have sovereignty except it's, it's conducted as a different kind of election entirely. Um, well, uh, there was uh, there was an amendment to the Constitution which provided for a direct popular election of the Constitution. I think this is a wonderful moment. To <laughs> 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 we'll continue that discussion uh, later, I'm, and I'm happy to do so. And give you all an opportunity to voice your opinions and have you sign books if at all possible. So please, one more time, put your hands together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.